I'm pleased to introduce uh, John Watson, who is giving a paper today entitled BlackRock's Environmental Activism in the Third Stage of Corporate Governance. John is spending uh, this term in Cambridge as the Pembroke Visiting Professor of International Finance at the Judge. Uh, we're delighted he's able to make time to talk with us today. Uh, John is the managing partner of Sinclair Capital LLC, a strategic consultancy to institutional investors, and is also a senior fellow at the High Meadows Institute. Throughout his career, John has been uh, the investment advisor or trustee for investors with assets under management with a value exceeding $100 billion, perhaps most no notably New York City's pension funds. In the 1990s, John co founded the International Corporate Governance Network, an investor led organization dedicated to promoting better corporate governance. He also set up Governance Metrics International, a uh, corporate governance rating service, which is now part of MSCI. John recently uh, wrapped up more than a decade as the director of the IRRC Institute, which uh, funds um, both academic and practitioner research. While there, he oversaw more than 75 research projects. Finally, John is a prolific author. His most recent book, What Do They Do With Your Money, was published by Yale University Press in 2016. He's currently working on a new book, which relates closely to what he's talking about today. It's little wonder that given the foregoing, Forbes magazine has called John one of the pioneers of modern corporate governance. And we very much look forward to hearing his talk. So John, whenever you're ready. Thank you. I should just mention that since he was nice enough to First off, thank you, Brian, and thank you, Felix. But secondly, since he was nice enough to come up from London, the co-author of what they do with your money being sitting here. So um, any good ideas are his, any bad ideas in that book, I claim solely for myself. Um, so 25 years ago, I had an epiphany. I was, at the time, as Brian said, in New York City. I was the official in charge of managing the city's pension funds. Um, it was only the mid-1990s, so the 10th largest pool of assets in the world was only $80 billion of asset owner assets in the world. Um, and, but I was responsible, in large part, for the retirement security of half a million police firefighters, teachers, clerks, and other workers, both working and retired. I had a staff of 60. I had five boards of trustees I reported to. Um, I hired, fired, oversaw scores of managers, had to deal with auditors, accountants, actuaries, NGOs, um, bond math, ISDA agreements, um, and I was, of course, supposed to be on top of, or better yet, ahead of what's going on in the market. So as you might imagine, it was incredibly rewarding, but also just a little bit frenetic. And one afternoon, I actually had some time to think, and I realized what an incredible waste of time and energy all this was. Because, you see, I came, the aha moment, the epiphany, was what I really needed had nothing to do with any of that. What I really needed was some place to put $80 billion to earn a rate of return above inflation forever. Now, on the one hand, that's very free. It's a very simplifying and qu actually quite accurate statement of the problem. On the other hand, we were taught to invest via modern portfolio theory. And modern portfolio theory has a paradox, which is it's very good on how to diversify your risk among individual securities, what they call idiosyncratic risk. It's not really good on what do you do about your beta problem. Beta is how investors refer to the risk of return of the overall market. And depending on the study that you look at, systematic risk, systematic variability of returns, actually determines 75 to 95 percent of your return. So the MPT paradox is it's silent on how to deal with that. So it focuses you on what you can deal with, stock selection, portfolio construction, bond selection, whatever, asset allocation. But what it focuses you on is, in effect, what matters least. Now, systematic return, systematic risk, alpha, beta, variability. That's a very bloodless way of thinking. And in fact, MPT is bloodless. You take a screen and you do your trades. 
And that's because modern portfolio theory doesn't care about the causes of the risk that manifests in the marketplace. Doesn't care if it's the normal to and fro of the economy or the global financial crisis. Doesn't care if it's apartheid in South Africa or the troubles in Northern Ireland or insurrections in the Middle East, all of which get lumped as country risk, but it doesn't really care about that either. It doesn't care if it's lack of diversity on board. It doesn't care if it's income inequality. It doesn't care if it's climate risk. Now, as human beings, we all care, or at least I hope we care, for workers who suffer um, from stressed economies, for the societal frame that comes about with income inequality, for the essential unfairness of racial, ethnic, gender, sexual orientation, discrimination, and for lives lost in wounds and conflict areas. But for MPT, none of that matters. The only thing that matters is the outcome, which is it produces volatility in the markets, variability in price expectations, and so a marketplace. And MPT, as I said, does just ways to diversify idiosyncratic risks, like this corporation isn't performing as well as that corporation. But in some ways, and it does that by diversifying, right? But in some ways, it's just the math that quantifies advice going back to Cervantes and Don Quixote in 1615, when he said, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And when it comes to this big issue of systematic risk, how do I get someplace to put that $80 billion? It's silent. And what I came to realize is what I needed was a healthy economy and a healthy capital markets as a transition mechanism from that economy to my returns. And I did find a tool. So, and the tool I found was corporate governance. So the first point I want to talk about today is how corporate governance evolved from that point, what I'll call stage one corporate governance, to where we are today, which is I'll call stage three corporate governance. Now, 10 years before my epiphany, I had been staff at the same office I later led. Normal progression. And the 1980s were a fascinating time for corporate governance in the markets. Um, it was the confluence of several trends that as usual, when you're in the midst of the trend, you don't realize it, but later have proven very important. And it gave rise to modern corporate governance. Corporate governance itself dating back to the Dutch East Indies Company when the first shareholder activist in the world was formed because he objected to getting his dividends in nutmeg instead of gilders. So the changes that happened in the 1980s, though, gave rise to the modern corporate governance world. And the first trend was that capital markets were rapidly institutionalizing. When modern portfolio theory was devised in 1952, Harry Markowitz gets a Nobel Prize, it was 92% retail investors, mom and pop investors. Today, it is almost exactly the reverse. More than 90% of developed market markets are institutional. BlackRock, the Cambridge Endowment, whatever it is, it is institutionalized. So in the 1980s to 90s, it was fairly early innings in that institutional game, but at least we were in the game. We were no longer on the sidelines. Now, that wasn't obvious at the time, however. The power structure of the corporation, actually I should defer to Brian on this, um, was pretty well set. It had been set for generations. Simply put, CEOs ruled. The constraints on their power were few and weak. Even the board of directors, to whom we turn to now as the fiduciary, was ineffectual as being kind. Harvard professor Miles Mace famously called the directors of a corporation ornaments on a corporate Christmas tree. Um, a decade later, even, Peter Drucker, the most famous management guru of time, said, and I quote, there is one thing all boards have in common. They do not function. So management ruled the roost, often enjoying a sense of entitlement and not very keen to have any in interference on running, quote, their, end quote, company. So CEO primacy was, in fact, the situation in the 1980s. 
Then came a little thing called green mail, and all hell broke loose, which is the technical term for a paradigm shift. Now, everyone in this room who is a student is too young to remember green mail, so let me explain it to you. It was the capital market equivalent of blackmail. Or maybe in today's world, a cyber ransom attack. What happened was a raider, a green mailer, would buy shares of a company and call the CEO and say, hey, you know, I've got X amount of your shares and I was thinking about launching a hostile takeover. And of course, you're not going to be the CEO after that. And after the CEO gulped a little bit, he said, but you can, and I'm using he because so far as I know, there were no famous female green mailers. Um, but, you know, you could stop this, just buy my shares back at a premium. And I'll agree to a standstill and never buy your shares of your company again. And in fact, that was the equivalent of the unmarked bills in an unmarked envelope or Bitcoin to an account in Singapore. And that's what happened. And this wasn't an isolated occurrence. Sir James Goldsmith, Green Mill, $93 million from Goodyear Tire and Rubber. Saul Steinberg hit Walt Disney for $60 million the same year that he Green Mill Quaker State and Penn Central. In one year, and in April 1984, Green Mill has extracted $4 billion in 1993-1994 dollars from the U.S. equity markets. And everyone was happy. The green mailer was happy and rich. The CEO was happy and back on the throne. And the only people who suffered were the shareholders, which my boss, who was running the New York City's pension funds, was. And the Disney payment to Steinberg was really the spark that forced institutional investors to say, finally, not with our money. And we formed something called the Council of Institutional Investors. Um, to give you a difference of scale. There were 21 investors with about a grand total in the 80s of about $100 billion. Today it has 135 asset owner members with $4 trillion and 160 large asset managers with $25 trillion. Clearly there was a need then and there continues to be a need now. So the burgeoning power of institutional investors exploded onto the marketplace. Green mail was happening, by the way, the terms back then, if you haven't looked at it, the legal history of this is fascinating. There were green mails and white knights and Pac-Man defenses and deadhead pills. And I wish the legal profession were as creative now in terming things. It made it much more exciting to read the newspapers. Um, in my office, we needed to pick and choose when that power could be used because American jurisprudence is actually very specific about when things go to the shareholders as opposed to the board, and off it's around changing capital structure. So we picked and chose when we would strike. The first case was the recapitalization of a oil company. Um, we attracted a bunch of bold-faced names, T. Boone Pickens, Carl Icahn, who's still around, soon to be convicted insider trader Ivan Bosky, and they all of a sudden faced a thicket of television cameras. First time this sort of thing had ever been leading the evening news because all of a sudden everyone woke up that this was about power and money and in the case of one particular famous case, sex. And what could be better to sell on television than money, power, and sex? So that's what we sold. And we were able to get into the game and change things. For instance, the next time there was an issue was an American icon. General Motors, Roger Smith was the CEO. He um, had a slightly problematic board member named H. Ross Perot, an iconoclastic businessman um, that he had gotten onto the board when he bought Ross's company. And he didn't want him on the board anymore because Ross was saying, you're not managing the company very well. And so he said, go away. I don't want you as a board member. Oh, by the way, to make you go away, here's $700 million. We didn't particularly like that. We asked Roger Smith to come meet with us. He said no. And my boss issued a press release that basically said, if this chairman of General Motors won't meet with us, perhaps the next one will. And Roger caved and came within a week. So, as you might gather from those situations, stage one corporate governance was really defensive in nature. 
It was about protecting our economic interests against what economists call rent seeking, insiders extracting value from the from the corporate entity that they didn't deserve to get. And we focused on techniques and structures that prevented rent seeking, more independent directors, takeover devices, should actually be takeover devices, not ensconcing devices for management. The defensive posture of stage one corporate governance began to change following a speech at the Council of Institutional Investors by well-known corporate lawyer, Aaron Milstein and Wild Gottschall, who um, later was one of the wise men that drafted the OECD corporate governance principles with Sir Adrian Cadbury here. And Ira urged us to focus on underperforming companies. Now, this was intuitively really attractive to us. It was attractive for two reasons. First, our interest in this was economic. And we saw it as a way to get the herd to run. Sort of, let's pick off the slowest running zebra and get the rest of the herd to run faster. And if you're looking at the underperformers, that does it. The second is, it was all still new. And while we were in the game, we certainly didn't have the all-star cast. And it gave us immediate credibility because the biggest offense any of the corporations and CEOs had against us is, why are you doing this? Everything's fine. Well, if you pick the underperformers, by definition, everything's not fine. So that's what we did. And once performance became a selection criteria, you know, it's not long before you measure performance. And there's a famous study that probably wouldn't hit academic standards today, but was hugely influential at the time that looked at CalPERS, the large California pension fund, had created the target list. And the target list, um, when they looked at it, said that for the five years prior to California's intervention, those companies had underperformed the S&P 500 by more than 75%. Makes sense. They were selecting underperformers. And in the five years post-intervention, they outperformed by more than 50%. Again, don't know if it meets academic rigor, but boy, it got a lot of headlines and made everyone think. And then McKinsey came out with a very famous study that said that investors would pay 11% more on average for a well-governed company. So we started playing defense and offense, and that laid the groundwork for today's activist investors, but that's a whole other talk that we don't have time to get to. Um, but in that year, most of the function was on governance, the G, the famous ESG, or environmental, social, and governance. And that was soon to change. Now, it's not that the ENS were ignored. In fact, the entire structure of shareholder proposals and stuff came from the S world. Peter Klapman, who was the general counsel at TIA Cref, which at the time was sort of the US equivalent of USS here, um, was a veteran of the South Africa struggle. Um, and realized that we had used shareholder resolutions in that situation. Well, we could use them in this governance, and that's how that came to be a key tool in governance. And the environmental side wasn't ignored either. In um, 1989, I think it was, the Exxon Valdez an oil tanker crashed in Prince William Sound in Alaska and sent pictures of dying oil-covered sea mammals and seabirds around the world and became a scandal. It also severely affected Exxon stock. And so the Exxon Valdez principles, which later became the series principles, um, were formed in my office, um, or what would be my office. And um, that series is still around as a very influential environmental joint corporate investor organization that, um, in fact, gave rise to the Global Reporting Initiative and was a founding member of Climate Action 100, which are two of the more important environmental and social entities today. Um, by the way, just as an aside, the Sears principles were originally called the Valdez principles until the very first CEO that wanted to sign said, you've got to change the name. No one wants to be associated with a bunch of principles that produce my dead oily birds. So that's how it became the Sears principles rather than the Valdez principles. Good advice. It's worked so well. So the focus was on governance. Um, it was, there were stirrings about what I had felt that we needed a healthy economy as well as a healthy capital market built to work together. And that really got turbocharged in 2005. Then UN Secretary General Kofi Annan um, brought together a number of investors, um, including David, um, to form the principles for responsible investment. 
and that really turbocharged um, ENS. So this is what I call stage two of corporate governance. The focus was still on value creation, but it went from a micro focus on capital markets, get the herd to run of individual companies, to macro, we need to do something about the social and environmental aspects of it. And stage two governance continues to this day, um, while corporate governance obviously is much more than about shareholder votes, even in the US. They are data points. And last year, there were 457 environmental and social proposals brought to a vote in the United States. And those resolutions you know, range from reporting on climate change to human capital management. They, um, average support on those resolutions is up about 40% in a decade. Now it's about 26% on average. So phase two corporate governments did expand our focus to ENS, but it still was focused on individual companies. Yes, there was the hope that we could get the herd to run by picking off those slow zebras, but we weren't quite feeding the entire herd vitamins yet. Today, that's what's changing. So my second point is we are today in the third stage of corporate governance in which investors target the systematic risks that themselves give rise to problems in society and the environment and the capital markets. MPT already had security selection and portfolio construction. This adds a third leg to that stool, making it secure what um, my co-author Jim Bolley and I call beta activism. Unlike alpha activism that Carl Icahn or Chris Hodge, um have where they target individual company, we target market-wide risks. And perhaps the purest example of this comes from the largest asset owner in the world. In November of 2017, Hiromichi Mizuno, the executive managing director of the Japanese government pension fund, GPIF, um, with assets of about $1.4 trillion, noted that due to its sheer size, its returns are, what I realized, are only a function of the real world economy rather than being a benchmark. In fact, he said it was almost irrelevant. And he announced that GPIF would actually invest in specialty managers designed to improve the environmental and social performance of the Japanese economy. It wasn't him that he was ignoring the G, by the way, but since it was an add-on to him, he already had staff on board that had the G, so he had all of the SG covered. Here in the UK, LGIM, the um, LGIM, the, the asset management arm of legal in general, is well known for its stewardship activities, but I want to read to you on the website, it says, Classic stage two governance, it strives to achieve positive societal impacts in the belief that it will create more sustainable long-term value. But then it goes on and it says that one of the ways it tries to do this is by influencing the debate. Quote, we take action to address key themes and emerging governance and sustainability issues that could impact the value of our clients' investments. We have a responsibility to address topics that can impact all companies. They may be done by engaging directly with companies or with governments, regulators, other investors, and wider shareholders. Now think about that for a minute to understand how different that is as an investment process from moving dots on a trading screen. Elgin is trying to influence regulation, jawboning the market, making common cause with other investors, engaging with NGOs, and stage three governance investors understand that to change the system, to address the root causes of the systematic risk, as opposed to just accepting the volatility that comes from them, you have to do root cause analysis and address those root causes. So let me give you one example each of stage three governance. Um, since I said I'd end with BlackRock, we'll go in reverse order GSP. In November 2014, my old funds, the New York City funds, announced the Boardroom Accountability Project. Now, we all know that who the directors are of a corporation matter. They, and virtually every investor in the United States, has been frustrated by who gets on boards. They're not diverse. They're 
not responsive. They're much better than they used to be in mild bases in Peter Drucker's time. And I don't want to say there haven't been improvements there have. But the responsiveness to the capital providers is somewhat limited. And that's because we don't really nominate them. The United States Securities and Exchange Commission tried to solve that problem through a process called proxy access, if anyone really wants to know about the rules of 25% non-takeover. I'll be glad to go through it, but suffice it to say this was a way to have direct nomination of investors. Um, and so the SEC promulgated a rule. I said before CEOs were ensconced. Well, you know, people don't like to change. And so the Chamber of Commerce representing largely the executives of the major corporations challenged the rule in court and won. So the rule was initiated. However, the court said there was an exception that if the shareholders of any particular company wanted to, quote, private order, meaning, you know, bring it up at that company, they could do so. Really hard to do. In 2014, proxy access only existed in six companies in the entire United States capital market. So it was sort of like, oh, thanks much, and it's part of the world that you never forgot about it, except... It was a small hole you could drive a back truck through, and that's exactly what New York City did. It formed an alliance with some California funds and some other funds and said, we're going to try and make proxy access the standard of governance in the United States. And we're going to do that initially by targeting 75 companies. So, in fact, they announced that. Now, the unusual circumstances around a rule being made, a rule being initiated, an exception, an announcement, created a natural experiment that some smart SEC economists latched onto. And what they found was that the Board of Accountability Project, just the announcement of it, right? No guarantee of success, not more than 75 companies, created a 53 basis point excess return at those companies. And today, in fact, Proxy access has taken off and become something of a de facto standard for large cap American companies. As of July 2019, less than five years after that initial announcement, more than 600 U.S. companies, up from six, have proxy access. So, look after the economics, change the standard. Standard setting, private sector standard setting, again, across a wide variety of companies designed to affect the whole market is addressing the systematic risk, the governance risk, and they have been successful at it. Let's move on to the S, the social. Have any of you ever seen a photograph, or maybe if you visited New York City in person, Fearless Girl, that great bronze statue, Seeds and Dodson. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, there is a wonderful statue of a young woman, 10, 11, 12, I don't know how old, um, sitting with her, standing with her hands on her hips, staring defiantly into space. And it became a little bit of a feminist icon. And it was initially placed staring right at the charging bull on Wall Street. Like, I'm not scared of you. You know, it was just really in your face. In fact, it was so good that the sculptor of the bull sued to have it replaced and removed. Um, so that statue was actually commissioned by State Street Global Advisors, one of the big three in investing. And it was done to publicize its gender diversity campaign. State Street had come to the realization that boards of directors around the world were not diverse, particularly in gender issues, other issues as well, but particularly in gender issues. And it started by publicizing a number of studies it had that said that that um, decreased resilience of the companies decreased ability to capture opportunity cost of the company, commissioned Fearless Girl, and then it wrote to 1,357 global companies that had single sex, single gender boards. As of September 2019, so just about two years later, 582 of those companies have either added diversity to their boards or pledged to do so this year, um, including, by the way, 85 here in the UK. So that, of course, brings us to the E, the environmental issue. I had my epiphany 25 years ago. About 25 days ago, a much more consequential figure in investing than I had his epiphany. 
On January 11th, Larry Fink, the chief of Lidster and BlackRock, announced to the world that climate risk is investment risk. Now, to be sure, that wasn't new. Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, has been warning about a so-called Binsky moment due to climate risk for years. A Binsky moment is when asset values collapse because people understand that things have changed to the point where you just can't burn the, the fuel, you can't do anything, and so all the things we thought were valuable are no longer valuable. The Bank for International Settlements. I mean, this is the banker's bank has told central banks, if there is a climate risk financial disaster, don't come running to us. We can't cover it. Go start working with your national governments now. So the fact that climate risk is investment risk was nothing new. But the fact that BlackRock was saying it was news. BlackRock is the world's largest asset manager, some $7 trillion in assets. And Fink has been writing letters to CEOs for years about you have to think long term, you have to have a societal purpose. But BlackRock itself has been criticized for greenwashing, to put it plain and simple, for not walking the walk of the talk it's given. Some of it, it hadn't joined Climate Action 100, the 350 of its asset management peers had. Some of its votes on disclosure, two degree strategic planning, were inconsistent at best, and some climate activists would say um, problematic and um, rearward looking. BlackRock justified it by saying they were in private talks with various companies. People didn't know what was in those talks, that the votes were strategic to advance the agendas in those talks, but the talks weren't transparent to anyone who wasn't in the room. However, as I found out 25 years ago, when you have an epiphany, things become manifest. They become really clear. BlackRock joined Climate Action 100 two days before the letter. And in his letter, he wrote, quote, climate change has become a defining factor in companies' long-term prospects. I believe we're on the edge of a fundamental reshaping of finance. And he announced, quote, a number of initiatives to place sustainability at the center of our investment approach including making sustainability integral to portfolio construction and risk management, exiting investments that present high sustainability-related risks, such as thermal coal producers, launching new investment products that screen fossil fuels and strengthen your commitment to sustainability and transparency in our investing stewardship activities. And that's what everyone picked up on. I picked up on something a little further down in the letter. He asked the CEOs to whom the letter was addressed, and this is the largest investor in the world, um, with assets about twice what the endowment of Cambridge University is. Um, so he owns all these companies in material shapes. He asked all the CEOs to report on their ESG risks according to something called SASB, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, and on their climate risk according to CD TCFD, the uh, Climate Disclosure Framework, so the Task Force on Climate-Related Disclosures. Um, now, reporting of ESG factors has been, to some extent, still is a ball of confusion. There is an alphabet soup of ways to report. The governments, the major accounting standards centers have not wanted to touch this. And so there have been a number of private sector initiatives, all of which are fighting with each other's for privacy. Um, in addition to FASB and TCFD, there's CDP, EEI, GRESB, GRI, IIRC, IPSHA, the SDGs, oh, and about 90 more. So what BlackRock did is it's saying, we're the largest investor in the world, we're going to standard set, much like New York City said, we're going to standard set on what governance standards are. We're going to say, we need some uniformity here, we need some standards, please report this way. And already, in fact, SASB has reported that it's been inundated with incoming calls since Larry Fink's letter. And I think setting standards across the market is both a game changer and a classic third stage government tool. It's not picking and choosing companies and saying we need to set a standard across the market. Now, as I note, BlackRock was not a leader in fighting climate change. And I say that not to criticize BlackRock, actually. When you're the world's largest investor, there are certain constraints that you have. I get that. Um, 
But to emphasize just how strongly BlackRock's announcement that of what it's going to do means that beta activism, a classic third stage of corporate governance device, is now mainstream. Um, so that's where we are. That's what I think BlackRock's um, announcement represents. I want to thank Felix and Brian for the invitation to talk. Um, I note, much as I did with David, that the good parts of this paper belong to Jim Hawley and the bad parts to me. Um, and I'd be glad to take questions because I was told to leave time for questions. So I hope I do.